last week. There are two more churches that we need to cover. I'll try to cover them fairly quickly, um, go over a few things, and then I'm going to hand off to to um, yeah, um, hand off to Bob uh, so he can pick up with uh, Revelation four. So the the next church that we haven't covered yet is Thyatira, um, and I think of this as kind of the anti-Ephesus. And we'll, we'll uh, talk about why in a minute. This is the, the modern city of Akisar. I'm probably butchering the name. Um, the name comes from the Greek word meaning daughter. If you look at this, this is interesting actually. This is the existing ruins in the city. Uh, right behind it, there's modern buildings and cars and people walking, right? There's about a block in the middle of this town that's the remaining ruins, and that's it. The whole town is just built up around it. That's, that's what they have left right there in the middle town. <clears throat> it's about 40 miles southeast of Pergamon. Um, it's a fairly, it was, I anyway, it's a fairly small town. Wouldn't really be notable, except for this letter, uh, which, as it happens, is the longest of the seven letters. Okay? Um, it was famous for uh, purple dye, and trade guilds that made cloth. Okay, We see it mentioned in Acts 16 when Paul is speaking in Macedonia. And it says in Acts, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening when, when Paul was speaking. Okay. So, Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29 here. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, and this is really small, so I, I apologize for focusing on that. Uh, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than the first, but I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the, children, all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds of hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Good rousing encouragement, right? Um, so consider, first of all, uh, very right off, how does he introduce himself? Not as the son of man here, but as the son of God. Okay? Very clear distinction. Eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, polished. Okay? This is the idea of, of authority and judgment. Okay? Um, it's notable, he says, and this is why I say they're like the anti-Ephesus. Love and faith and service, they're doing pretty good on that. <coughs> right? <coughs> on, on, on loving people and service and that sort of thing, got that down. But there's this Jezebel woman. All right? There's a problem in this church. So who is she? We're not really sure. There's some speculation. She might, she might have been the, the wife of a pastor. Not really sure. It's kind of a guess that some people make. Um, but in any case, she's obviously in some sort of prominent leadership position. Um, if probably not actually her name. This is more like a, a type. It's a reference to uh, Jezebel in First and Second Kings. Um, she calls herself a prophetess. It's possible, um, you know, that she might not actually be a believer. I'm not sure. Um, but obviously, she's. It, this is past getting mixed up in immorality. She is promoting it. She is pushing it. She is encouraging this activity. Okay, This is obviously a major problem. Um, even then, and this is, this is striking, even then, verse 21, I gave her time to repent. In God's grace, even for her, she has time to repent. She can turn around. Obviously, she did not. Okay? Um, there's a, a, a balance here, if you will. I will throw her on a bed of sickness. Contrast it with a bed of immorality that she was involved in. Okay. There's a mention of actual adultery as opposed to a uh, kind of more generic uh, sense of sexual immorality that we see referenced elsewhere. This is a, a reference of actual adultery that she's uh, involved in. 
Um, and there's this phrase here, uh, he's talking about not only her, but those who commit adultery with her, unless they repent of her deeds. Okay, She is dragging people down. It's not just what she's doing, but she is dragging other people down with her. And the Lord's saying they need to repent of this garbage that she is getting them involved in. Okay? Um, and I want to call this out a little bit here. Uh, all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. This word mind is actually literally kidneys. There is no hiding from the Lord. Okay? There is no sense in which we can pretend to be one thing and secretly be something else and God not know about it. Right? Okay? I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your deeds. Okay, so moving on to the next section. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast till I come. He who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, this is the first time in these letters that a, a subgroup, if you will, is, is sort of uh, mentioned specifically, separate from the whole. Okay, the rest of you, people who aren't caught up in this garbage, okay, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known these things, I place all the burden on you. You're doing good, hold on. Keep up the good work, okay? Um, it's almost, it's similar to uh, in Acts 15 when the council was meeting to, to think about, you know, what are we going to do with the Gentile believers? What uh, requirements are we going to place on them? It's this idea of, okay, we're going to keep this real simple, okay? Same idea here. I'm not going to place any of the burdens on you. You're doing enough for now. Just don't get wrapped up in that. Hold firm, okay? And then we have a reference to the role of believers in the millennial kingdom. Uh, he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. We're going to come back to this question of overcomers, by the way. Um, once, once we're done with the, the churches, I'm gonna, I want to revisit that because we talked about it a bit last week. Um, and there's this, this thing at the end, I will give him the morning star. And it's actually kind of, what, what, what does that mean? Is that referring to Christ himself? Um, there was one possibility that I came across that was, well, this isn't that morning star. Maybe it's referring to uh, Venus, and Venus means victory, so it's sort of a parallel with Pergamum. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's part of the promises. And some of these promises, we're not quite sure exactly what they mean. Um, and so that, that can be a little difficult to, to wrestle with. But, um, but nonetheless, there's, there's a promise for the overcomers. Any questions on Thyatira before I... Move on and kind of sit through that quick. Yeah, I just think it's an it's an interesting connection that that this church is, you know, that his their initial problem is that is not immorality. It's that they tolerate, yeah, the teaching of immorality. And he's telling them don't do that. And then if they overcome and they don't do that, then he's going to give them authority over the nations. And I see kind of a connection there. In other words, if you want yeah. a role in governing the nations. Then show me now that you know how to govern a church. Yeah. You know, yeah. So Excellent. very good. Everybody catch that? This idea that if if, if you if you're gonna be involved in governing in the kingdom, you need to be actively showing now that you can be responsible, you can have discernment, you can make these kind of decisions. Okay? Any other questions, any other thoughts? The entire free move on. Okay. Laodicea, which Google tells me it's supposed to be pronounced Laodicea, but I'm so familiar with calling it Laodicea, I'm not even going to try to correct myself. Just bear with me. Um, it's about 90 miles east of Ephesus, and about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. Remember that, how the map, the, the, the roads kind of came up and, and went down a bit, so we're, we're about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. Uh, it's in the Lycus Valley. There are three main roads that sort of converged on this spot. Um, Laodicea was a leading banking center. And by that I don't mean they had banks. 
I mean, this was the Manhattan Wall Street of the time. This was a major banking center, okay? Cicero, believe it or not, cashed drafts there in 51 BC, okay? Um, a little over 100 years after that, in AD 60, Laodicea was destroyed in an earthquake. And they said, we got to rebuild. No thanks, Rome. We don't need your help. We're good. Okay? They had enough wealth that they rebuilt their city by themselves without Rome's help. Okay? They were very self-sufficient, very um, uh, stable in their, in their wealth and, and self-provision. There are two other things that are notable for. They produce um, a glossy black uh, fabric for those use in some clothing, rugs, that sort of thing. And they had a medical school in town that, that made this healing eye salve that people, that they were known for, okay? So, one other notable thing for the town, they didn't have a source of hot water. There weren't any hot springs or anything. There was a sister city called Hierapolis. It was only about five miles away. And they had an aqueduct system to pipe this water into Laodicea. Except by the time it got there, it wasn't hot anymore. It was kind of lukewarm. Okay? All right. So we're in Revelation 3. We, we, we've skipped a bit. We're, we're now at the end of chapter 3, verses 14. We're starting verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy gold from me, gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Obvious connections with some of the things that the town is known for, right? Okay. First of all, just to get this out of the way, uh, the, the beginning of the creation of God, we're not talking about Jesus as a created being. It's more like the origin, the 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 creator. Okay. Uh, just to get that out of the way in case I was confused by that point. Um, is Jesus speaking to believers here? Yes. Yes? No? Yes. He's speaking to his church. Okay. But if you ask them if they were believers, they'd be like, yeah, it's cool. Sure. They're believers. Right? It's, it's almost like, I get this picture of, of the man who, you know, the, the parable, the, the man who sold everything, right? And he buys a field because there's a treasure in it. It's that important. And if you ask these guys, hey, do you guys have that treasure? They'd be like, yeah, it's in a box in the closet somewhere. Sure. What? Like, you got to be kidding me. They have been given the precious promises of God. And they're like, yeah, whatever. Okay? Jesus says, you make me sick. What are you doing? Why don't you care? This is not, um, this is not just like, oh, yeah, this is nice, but we're good. Thanks. No. This is real. Okay? So we, we see this. He, he, this is not, I mean, this is pretty strong language, okay? And, and throughout this, you see these references to, to the things, the specific things that they rely on. They think they're okay for, right? They, they think they're wealthy. And right here we see you're wretched and miserable and poor. You think you're wealthy, but you're poor and you're blind, your eyes aren't so great after all, and you're naked, your clothes aren't so great after all, right? But you need to buy from me real gold, refined by fire, and real rich white garments so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and real eyes sad, okay? He's not talking about the earthly things. They're relying on the earthly things, and Jesus is saying, that's garbage, okay? You're relying on garbage. You need to snap out of it. All right? Now, does Jesus reject them? 
Let's keep reading. Verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. He loves them. He's not, when he says, I'm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, he's not saying, I'm rejecting you from the kingdom, I'm kicking you out, you're done. He's just saying, you make me sick. Knock it off. I love you. Straighten up. Okay? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Nobody's ever heard this verse before in your life, I'm sure. <laughs> if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him, and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as, also, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Is verse 20 speaking about salvation? Okay, come on. No. Thank you. Thank you. It feels good. It makes for a great Thomas Kincaid painting. But no, this is not talking about salvation. Okay. What he's saying is, this, this is a picture, by the way. Uh, I will come into him and will dine with him. We see this picture throughout Scripture. It's a very intimate um, it, breaking bread together. We're relaxing on pillows. We're talking. It's a very intimate time. Okay. This is how they fellowship together. And Jesus is saying, that's what's supposed to happen. Why am I outside of, outside of this door? I'm standing out here in the cold. I want to come in. I want that with you. But I'm not going to break down the door. Okay? You've got to let me in. And if you let me in, I will come in. And I'll dine with you. And it'll be great. But if you don't... Right? If you don't, it's not going to be so great. Okay? This this is not, and just to say it one more time, this is not about salvation. This is he's talking to believers, he's talking to his church. And he's standing on the outside of the door where he's not supposed to be. Okay? And he's saying, Why am I out here? Please let me in. I want to be with you. I want to dine with you. I want to have this fellowship with you. And I'm out here in the cold. Okay. Um, any questions on this? This church, the Church of Laodicea, is the one that I think most um, challenges me personally, and and as a member of the larger. Uh, Western Evangelical Church. Okay? How many of us could this apply to? We are comfortable. Okay? I'm not saying everything's awesome. We've got job concerns. We've got, you know, challenges and whatever. But, come on. Are we Smyrna? I don't think so. We're a long way from Smyrna here in America. Okay? How easy is it for us to fall into this kind of casual treatment of the promises of God? Okay? How easy is it for us to sit back and say, yeah, I'm a believer. I've been to church. Yeah, that's cool. It's good. If we don't, that's great, but I believe this is a constant challenge that we need to be on guard against, okay? And I don't think everybody is. I'm not talking about you and you and you. I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. But I'm saying we here in Winchester, Frederick County, Virginia, the United States of America, this is huge. We need to be careful about this. We need to be careful about apathy, about being comfortable, about knowing that we have all our supplies taken care of. Right? We're good. Not too worried about our next meal. Not too worried about police knocking on the door and throwing us in prison. Yet, we may get there, but we're not there yet. Okay? We need to be on guard against this. Okay, any thoughts or questions before I move on? Yeah, Jane. I think it's interesting, um, verse 21, he who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. 
as I also overcame and sat down with my father yeah. on his throne, that's such an intimacy. That's such huge. A, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And I meant to draw that out. Thank you. That is, I mean, as a promise, this is a massive switch from you people make me sick. Right? If you shape up, you can sit on the throne with me. What? <laughs> It's like one of my kids wants to come sit in my lap. Kind of, okay. You know, you know it, it, it almost sounds blasphemous. It's like, are, are you serious? Like this, this even the one that I've mentioned before that blows my mind is, is the promise that we are co-heirs with Christ. Like that just, that just, I can't even, you know, really wrap my head around that. Co-heirs with Christ. This is even, you can still on throne with him. What are you talking about? He just said, "People make me sick." Okay? Again, he's not rejecting them. They can pull this, they can turn this around. But they gotta do it. Anything else? Yeah. Um, and maybe this is for another day. But where how does one overcome? We I mean I'm thinking of Romans 7 when we're stuck in this flesh and we struggle all the time. How can we become overcomers and inherit everything that's for us? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I want to, um, that actually leads right into uh, the next thing I wanted to, to talk about real quick. Um, and, and I want to come back to that question because I think that's something we need to chew on more. I think you're absolutely right. That's a, that can be difficult and challenging. Um, okay, so last week, you may remember, we sort of kind of chewed on this question of who are the overcomers. Um, I want to apologize, and I want to ask your forgiveness, okay? Because last week, um, I didn't feel that I handled this question very well, okay? Last week, I, I would go so far as to say I was in error, and I'll explain what I mean. Not necessarily, not necessarily for something that I said. There may have been something in there, I'm not sure. But for how I handled that question. You see, when I was preparing for, this, for these lessons, when I was studying these churches, I was focusing on history and culture and context and the, the letter structure and, and God's encouragements and his admonishments and, and all these sorts of things. And as I was studying, I came across you know, something that said um, uh, that, that the overcomers were believers and these were promises for believers. And I said, oh yeah, that makes sense. And I moved on. I didn't give it a whole lot of thought. Okay. Um, my error was that I treated this question as basically an afterthought. Not a good idea, okay? What you do with your faith matters. How you live your life of faith matters, okay? Ephesians, how you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, how you love the world around you matters, okay? Pergamum, how you care about whether or not you're being a stumbling block to your brothers matters, Thyatira, whether or not you deal with this woman who is close. This matters, okay? How you live your life of faith matters, okay? I dare say, correct me if I'm wrong, this is why we're teaching this class, okay? Because whether or not you understand what happens in the eschaton matters because how you live now matters, okay? Am I overstating that? That's exactly right. How you live now matters. There is going to be a judgment. There's going to be an evaluation. Okay. There's going to be rewards. This is important. Okay. And I think ending with Laodicea, especially for us, is perfect because he's saying, "Wake up. This matters. Okay. You need to care. All right." And that's all I've got. Thank you. That is the best I've ever heard Leo to see you taught, and I appreciate that um, from Joel. Uh, I agree 100%. And yes, really, yeah. his point, I, I really think his point uh, is right on the money, and Jesse was, was headed in exactly the same direction when he taught. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time on, on these letters. But I guess the thing that I would join with, with Joel and Jesse in saying is this. It's fun to study theology. It's fun to get these technical details down. But shame on us. Shame on us 
if we leave Revelation 2 and 3 without a firm commitment in our lives to be overcomers. That's what the whole point is. It's not to pass a, you know, some test of, you know, of, of theology. It's, it's, it's for me to leave Revelation 2 and 3 determined. I want to be that guy. Uh, I want to be this, this one that says, uh, or the one that uh, gets to sit on the throne with Christ. You know, it sounds, it sounds like almost ridiculous. I get to do that. I want to do that. I want to, I want to be one of those overcomers. I want to be one of those overcomers that Jesus brags about in front of the angels. You know, I want him to say my name like that. And I want him to say your name too. I want to be one of those guys that, that gets the morning star. And we can do that. You know, that's what this that's what these letters are all about, to urge us to become those overcomers as believers. And so I, I urge you, along with my fellow teachers, to discuss this with your family, with your spouse, about how we can build our lives in such a way as to honor the Lord like that, to, to strive for those rewards that He wants us to have. I'm, I, I'll never forget, I had a lady in class one time, I was teaching Revelation. We were talking about rewards, and she was just, I mean, she was clearly, she was actually sitting right up front. She was clearly, something was on her mind. And about halfway through class, she kind of raised her hand. She said, now, let me understand this. I'm saved. If I believed in Christ as Savior, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. The rest of this stuff, I really don't care about it. I don't care. I don't need reward. I don't need rewards. I just want to slip under the door, you know. I, and I, you know, I, I came across with the idea that, man, I must be a bad teacher, you know, to leave her with that impression. Is that, is that what we're thinking? That, okay, I, I'm going to take that part in the Bible that says that I'm eternally saved, and then that, that's it. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do anything else in my life. Uh, why is that? I mean, stop and think about that. Why would somebody have that attitude that all I want to do is slip under the door, just make sure I'm saved, and I don't really care about these rewards? Why would somebody say that, do you think? Somebody offer a thought, please. So they can live however they want. I think you're right on the money, Karen. That's, exa that's exactly it. In other words, what this person is saying is this. I am so fascinated and entertained by the devil's world that, that I really want to spend most of my time doing that as long as I got the eternity thing squared away. I'm saved. So, so imagine this then for a moment. Imagine this. 40 billion years from now, have you ever counted to a billion? You actually can't do it in a lifetime. You can't count to a billion in a lifetime. You don't have time. Now imagine 40 billion years from now, you're thinking about all the reward that you lost, all the failure in your life as a Christian, and why did you do that? Because you wanted 20 more years in the devil's world to enjoy that, as opposed to the billions of years of eternity. <laughs> Similar to what you just said about, I've got my fire insurance card, and I'm just going to slip under the door. I have one of the things, one of the things that, that we need to be careful about is I call, I often call Laodicea the measuring rod, measuring rod by which churches judge themselves. Mm -hmm. They'll look at, you know, this, that, or the other thing, and they'll say at least we're not like Laodicea. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're better than that. Yeah. Instead of saying we're just short, we're short of being Philadelphia. Yeah. We're short of being Smyrna. Or How do we get there? Right. Right. Because. You know, we need to. We, we should, to I, yeah, we should ask ourselves if if the shoe was on the other foot and Christ wrote a letter of two fellowship Bible church, said, "I know your deeds." Would he say, "But this I have against you," or would he say, "I have no condemnation yeah. for you"? Yeah, to be a You're church. You're a church after my own heart. To aspire to be a church that has no criticism. Yeah, yeah that, that's really what we should be doing. Please. No, I see it from another point of view as well that um, there are many, many churches in this country that teach none about um, eternity. They, they teach nothing about that. And right. So a person like that could be saying, okay, I'm in the door. I don't know anything else at all. I don't know the beauty of eternity. I don't know anything about um, reward.
words or anything. Um, but I'm glad to be in the door. And they don't see any enticement to doing anything more. They don't even know. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. And that's a teaching problem because it's the role of the church to acquaint people with with uh, eternity. I'm going to go here and then over to your bed. Uh, to piggyback on what she said, I was thinking the same thing that, uh, you know, the, the promises that are in Scripture, I mean, they're, they're, they're out there, like sitting on the front. It's hard to wrap your mind around something like that. Yeah. And coupled with the, the lack of, of accurate teaching, um, there's a lot of teaching out there that's very inaccurate. You don't really have a, a, a good grasp of what, what the reality is, and therefore you may not, most likely just don't believe it. Yeah. You don't think about it, and you really, you know, it's just like, you know, I, I don't know what to think. Yeah, I agree with you. And that, that's why I urge, and I, I mean this more sincerely than I can say, I really urge everyone here to take advantage of this church. Because this church is the finest teaching church I've ever been associated with. I hear proper doctrine being taught from pastors, from Sunday school teachers, from home group leaders, uh, from parents to children. I, there's a lot of good teaching going on here. And, and it's the kind of teaching that can set us up to be these overcomers. You know, and, and, and that's what we, what we ought to be aiming for. Then uh, you're going to say, please? Yeah, for decades we've been preaching salvation as a done deal. Right. You know, that's it. Yeah, you're saved, that's it. If you're already saved, we really got nothing for you. Unless you want to get saved again, we can do that. Or unless okay. you prosper in this lifetime. Yeah, right. But, but and, and the, tr the reality of it is, most of the New Testament is not talking about salvation. It really, that's a secondary issue, folks, in the New Testament. It's talking to believers about stuff after salvation, about how we should be living. And that's what this is all about, Jane. I think that um, churches, a lot of them, don't teach about the cost of sin, that the discipline of God is a very serious thing to face, but even beyond that, those who are looking on may not come to faith if they see a bad witness. So, I mean, that's that's a very serious concept. That's true. There it is. It, it, it affects our evangelism. Mike? Yeah. I, I love this conversation, but I've always had a hard time squaring the scriptures like, he who began a good work and you will be faithful to complete it. If yeah. it's him who's doing the work, and he is the one that's going to be faithful to complete it, well, what, what, is what Pastor Don, what Pastor Don would tell you about that particular verse in Philippians is that it's not talking about sanctification of the believer. There, he's actually talking about the the financial gift that 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 began. God is going to multiply that gift and make it continue to produce all the way down to the day of the Lord. Right, which okay. is good. But there's yeah. all kinds of teaching like that in Scripture and taught. Yeah. In, well, this is not, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is a good point, and, and we've we got to find the, the correct doctrinal position, the, the, the balanced position, which is this. Uh, do we teach salvation by works? No. There is no way to earn your way to heaven. If there were, then Christ would not have died the substitutionary death. Okay, so we know that. Number two, after salvation, am I supposed to use the power of Bob Leonard to accomplish great things for God? No. That's clearly not right, because that's the power of the flesh. That's not what we're supposed to do either. We are supposed to rely on the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of Christ, appropriate that grace, and then, and then grow. Now, is there effort involved? Yes, there is effort involved. Is it hard? Yes, it's hard. What, did he just say Christianity is hard? Yes, Christianity is hard. Salvation is easy. Salvation is easy. Christianity, following in the footsteps of Christ, is hard. It involves suffering. It involves discipline. It involves a team effort. It involves a lot of prayer. Some days you do it well. Other days you drop the ball. And you pick it up and you keep going again. That's the Christian life. I mean, what do you think, Mike? Is that, are you with me? I mean, you know, that's, yeah. So, so I, I agree with you. This is an important conversation to have. Please, if you get nothing else from, from Revelation, if you, if you end this class and you don't know anything about the beast or the abomination of desolation or the rapture or any of that other stuff, get this part right. Be an overcomer. Strive for that. That's what it's all about. 
That's how you get an A in, in, in the book of Revelation, striving to be one of those overcomers. Any other thoughts on that? Please. Well, the scripture says that we don't want to be ashamed at his coming. So right. it is possible to be Oh, yes, yes, indeed. At the judgment seat of Christ, there will be believers weeping with shame. Weeping with shame. And deservedly so, because they have failed to bring glory to the Lord who died for them. You know, and, and this attitude that I don't want oh, I don't want rewards. Let all me, I don't want rewards. That's false humility. Jesus wants you to want these rewards. Do you want to obey Jesus Christ, the Lord who died for you, who gave up everything for you? He wants you to want these rewards. Because they ultimately bring glory to God, because we're operating off of His power. Okay? So this is really, and, and I say, Joel, well done, and Jesse, I appreciate the, the good teaching and the study and the effort you put into those letters. And, and uh, I can tell you for certain, the, uh, Jesse and Joel and I are all on the same sheet of music as to what overcomers are. Um, and, and I'm glad that we're you know, bringing this out. They are believers who are fulfilling their destiny. Any other thoughts on this? Anybody want to disagree? Any arguments, debates, schisms, heresies? Okay. All right. Let's move on. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Reads like this. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just begun the third and final part of the book of Revelation. We are now in the eschaton talking about the future. The last days. Chapter 4 begins that. Everything before that, Revelation 2 and 3, we were talking about the age of the church. Now that is over with, we're going to be talking about the eschaton and, and what that looks like. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, this verse real quick, Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64 is kind of like a prayer. It's a prayer by a faithful Jewish prophet. And he's looking up to God. Isaiah 64, verse 1, and he says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. This is a, a desperate prayer from, from Isaiah, wanting to see heaven opened, because he knows that that's the, the first thing that's going to happen when the day of the Lord comes and the eschaton begins. You know, and, and Isaiah, as a believer, just like you and me, we long for the eschaton. We long for the end days because of all the good things that are going to happen there. And so when John says, look, behold, you know, he's very excited about this. A door standing open in heaven. I have no doubt he's thinking of Isaiah 64.1. The heavens have been ended. Wow! That stuff that Isaiah was praying for all those years ago, well, the door of heaven is open. This is what the eschaton is going to look like. So that's pretty exciting. Then he says that I, that I heard a voice uh, uh, that was uh, like a trumpet. And this, of course, refers back to Revelation uh, chapter 1 in, uh, in verse 10. Because as you recall, in that uh, slightly humorous part of, of uh, chapter 1, uh, John says, uh, you know, 90-year-old John says, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Okay, so imagine yourself praying, and all of a sudden you get that trumpet blast. I actually, when I taught this one time, I had my son Joe come in and sneak in the back of the classroom. You know, while while everyone there was, you know, typically there are you know three or four people asleep. So I told him to kind of sneak in the back of the classroom, and boom! He gave him this blast on the on the trumpet and almost killed somebody. It was awesome, really funny. So, so anyway, uh, but I mean that's so that's what he's hearing. He's hearing the voice of Jesus Christ. He's hearing the voice of Jesus Christ saying, come up here and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Okay, so uh, that's that's the subject. Now, um, 
some people believe, and I believe, that this command to come up here and I will show you things uh, is kind of a type of the rapture. In other words, it's kind of a clever little way to sort of portray the rapture because John is about to launch into a, a very symbolic, very visual picture of the tribulation. But before he gets to look at the tribulation, he goes up. Okay? Which is exactly what the church is going to do. Are you going to see the tribulation? You bet you are. But you're going to be seeing it from the balcony. You're going to be up first. You're going to be taken up in the in the rapture. Okay? And so this may be a, a type of the, of the rapture. And so what I'd like to do is take some time, because I think this is the right place to do it, to talk about this issue of the rapture. Okay? Um, so I want to begin by looking, first of all, what we call the normative passages. In other words, the main passages in the Bible that discuss the rapture. And, the, and probably the most important one you'll find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So if you flip over there real quick. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. A very important passage. And this is what it says. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. In other words, you're be, you're, the, the starting point for your understanding of the rapture has got to be your understanding of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It starts there. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, resurrected, that is ultimately going to lead to the rapture. Okay. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the, in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air, and so will, we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Now, a couple things in this passage I think are important to note. First of all, it starts with, with Paul saying to, to his flock in Thessalonica, I don't want you to be ignorant of these things. Is it possible to be ignorant and deceived in matters of eschatology? Yes. Yeah, in fact, that's kind of the normal status of most people. Uh, ignorant of the subject or deceived about the subject. It is a subject fraught with danger of deception. So, so it's incumbent upon us as believers to find a good Bible teaching church you know, get that teaching and check it out. When you hear what a teacher teaching you something, check out what the teacher's saying for yourself. Because teachers can deceive you. Teachers can be wrong. Okay, so we want to avoid ignorance. We want to avoid uh, deception. Uh, now, yes? Just a real quick mention, the Bereans are held up as, as an example. They're held up as yes. even more noble because they did because they checked out yeah and Joel point out you know the, the standard of the Bereans you know who who checked out what the teacher said and therefore and are praised for that and you know it's uh you know you kind of you kind of would expect if, if Paul were operating off of you know if, if, off of his sin nature he might have said those Bereans boy they're always bothering me and checking stuff out for themselves who do they think they are you know that kind of thing. no he says they're right on the money man that's what you do you check out your teachers make sure that you're that uh, they're not leading you wrong. Uh, and so that's what we, we, we encourage it as well. So he says um, uh, in verse uh, 13 there, we don't want you to grieve. Now here's a, here's a tricky little question. Why are the Thessalonians grieving? Why are these believers worried? What are they worried about? Missing the rapture. Yeah. Missing the rapture. Now that's a really good point. That's a, and I think you're exactly right. They're worried about who's going to miss the rapture. The dead. The dead, yeah. Now, now the question of them, the whole church missing the rapture, you'll see that in 2 Thessalonians. 
But in the in First Thessalonians, in chapter four, the, Paul is responding to a problem there, to a a plea from them. They're worried about those who have died, fellow believers who have died. Now, they're worried about those fellow believers because they're going to miss out, okay, is the idea. Now, the question would be, what are they going to miss out from, according to these believers, these mistaken believers in Thessalonica? And the answer, evidently, is the rapture. Okay, and this is one of the reasons we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Imagine this for a second. Imagine that the, that the rapture happens after the tribulation, and that therefore the church, you and I, we're going to go through the tribulation. All right. Now think about that for a second. Imagine that you're being taught that you're going to go through the tribulation, and then the person sitting next to you dies. Is that a good thing for them or a bad thing? That's a good thing because they just they just opted out of the tribulation problem. Okay? Uh, yeah, I wish I could do that because I don't want to go through the tribulation. It's a period of darkness. Um, so, the, the, so the believers at Thessalonica are worried about these dead believers that they've missed out on something, something good, not bad. Okay, and so that's one another reason why we believe in a pre-trib rapture, because these people were taught directly by Paul, and Paul is teaching them, hey, this awesome thing is coming for the church. It's called the harpazo, the snatching away. Well, wait a minute. What about these dead believers? And Paul's saying, oh, don't worry about that, because when the Lord comes down, there's no way that we're going to go first. Those guys are coming up first. It's actually an advantage to them. That's the point here in chapter 4. You understand? So they are anticipating this, this rapture as, as uh, you know, the next eschatological phenomenon. So he says, uh, uh, and, the, and of course the, the key verse here, uh, verse 17, it says, after that we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. That's the Greek word harpazo right here. Okay, and, and that Greek word, as I mentioned, I think, uh, in an you know, earlier lesson, that Greek word was translated by Jerome into the Latin word raptoro. And from that word, we get the word rapture. It all means the same thing, to snatch away, the catching away of the, of the church. Okay, so a pretty important passage. Questions about that? 1 Thessalonians 4. Secondly, uh, go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. And, uh, you know, I'm going to run out of time, which is fine, because we're just going to pick right up where we, where we left off next week. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, the context of 1 Corinthians 15, uh, you know, is very important to understand. Paul is writing to the Corinthians to correct false teaching that is going on. And the false teaching is coming from people who are mocking the idea of resurrection. It's, it's basically people in or associated or near the church in Corinth that are telling believers, you're not going to be resurrected. That's, that's ridiculous. You're not going to be resurrected. There is no such thing. And so Paul writes 1 Corinthians 15 and says to them, now wait a minute, guys. Resurrection is at the very heart of Christianity. It is fundamental to Christianity. In fact, if, Christ, if, if resurrection isn't so... Well, that undermines the whole faith. We're the most miserable people of all, if, that, if that's not the case. But it is the case. Jesus Christ was resurrected. And guess what? I've personally seen him, is what Paul says. So there's no doubt in Paul's mind, resurrection is a reality. Now, in that context, if you go to uh, verse 23, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. If, uh, I'll read the whole paragraph, starting verse 20, so you kind of get the sense. But he says, But Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, it says in, uh, the, in the NIV. What other words do you have there in that verse? Oh, Order. Order. Any, any other ones? It's the Greek word tagma, okay, which is a military term. And it, it kind of means the idea of a battalion. All right? And so the picture here in this verse is, uh, I've heard it best described this way. 
can imagine you're standing out on Main Street and there's a military parade going by, okay? And this parade is the Resurrection Parade, all right? The Resurrection Parade is about to march by you. Who's the first one at the head of the line? Jesus. Jesus Christ is the first one to march by. He's by himself. He's the first fruits of resurrection. Next comes the, the next battalion. And who is that? The dead. Uh, well, yeah, dead. you have to be dead to be resurrected. Well, say again? The dead uh, Yeah, what, from what group? The church. Age. Yeah, the church. So it's the church battalion is coming next. They're the second one in the, in the order of march. And yeah, the dead happen to be at the, at the front of the line, but they're all together in one order. Okay, the church is being resurrected. When does that happen? It happens on rapture day. Rapture day. That's when the resurrection happens. So if you're dead when rapture day comes around, you will come out of the ground and your body will be resurrected. If you're still alive, you will be caught up into the clouds and your body resurrected at that point. Okay, so resurrection and rapture, they go hand in hand. Okay, yeah. Do the Old Testament saints have their bodies resurrected yes. at the very end along with... Okay, so to continue the resurrection parade, the church marches by. Okay. The next battalion to come up and be resurrected are the second advent uh, resurrections. And that includes... Tribulation martyrs and Old Testament saints. Okay, and it's talked about Daniel chapter 12 in the Old Testament and, and other places as well. So, so there's a, the Old Testament saints. And then there's a final battalion that's actually not talked about in the Bible, but it must be implied, what, what, it must be inferred, and that is the resurrection of millennial saints who died, okay, which would happen at the end of the millennium. All right? So you have these different battalions marching by. We happen to be the second one that goes by. First Jesus Christ, the first fruits, and then the church. Okay? Well, yes. I just point out that that's all part of the first resurrection. Yes, right. Right. Then it's all the whole parade is called the first resurrection. And his point is very well taken because in uh, Revelation 20 it talks about the second resurrection, which is the one you don't want to be part of. That's the resurrection of all unbelievers for judgment, for the great for the final uh, uh, judgment of mankind. Because those people will live forever in the lake of fire. Okay? So you're right. That's the second resurrection. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if you uh, if you go down to uh, verse uh, 50, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verse 50, it says, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Notice it doesn't say that you can't enter, but it says you can't inherit in the kingdom of God. So those who are going to inherit the kingdom of God have to be in resurrection bodies. So it says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. They often call that uh, the nursery verse. You know, if you're, if you're ever babysitting in the nursery, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. But anyway, but it's not really. It's about, it's about, uh, it's about the, the rapture. I tell you, mystery, we will not all sleep. In other words, not all of you are going to be dead. Not all of you are going to go through physical death. But we will all be changed. All of us are going to be resurrected and, and our bodies changed. Uh, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for this trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must, must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Hua, uh, oh death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? The, the sting of death is sin, and the power of, this, of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that is, again, a normative passage associated with the rapture. And from 1 Corinthians 15, we learn that the rapture and resurrection go together, hand in hand. Okay? <laughs> Questions about that? Uh, so go to... Fl huh? Okay. Now go over to Philippians 15... Or, I'm sorry, Philippians 3, not 15. Uh, Philippians 3... And um, there's just a couple, I think, key verses here in uh, Philippians 3. And uh, we want to look at uh, uh, verses 20 and 21. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21 says this. But our citizenship is in heaven. Keep that in mind. Our citizenship is in heaven. The church 
There, our citizenship is in heaven. This becomes a huge issue in the book of Revelation. Because there's a whole other group of people whose citizenship is not in heaven, but explicitly on the earth. They're called the earth dwellers of, of Revelation, okay, to be distinguished from the church. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Again, a reference to your resurrection body in the future. And your resurrection body is going to be cool. One of the many great rewards we have as believers because you're never going to get bad knees again. You're never going to have arthritis. You're never going to have hemorrhoids. You're never going to have bad breath. You're, you're, always, you're never going to have another bad hair day. You're going to have a resurrection body, which is sown in dishonor and raised in honor and glory. Okay? Your body's going to be awesome. All right? So uh, it's something to look forward to. All right? So these are kind of the main passages. Any questions about those? Uh, okay, now, what are the issues with, uh, uh, and again, we have four minutes, don't, don't freak out, I'm not going to keep you, uh, we'll just pick right up next week, okay? But here, here's one of the issues that I want to get to uh, next week, and that is the timing of the rapture. When does it occur? Now, what I'm showing you here is the correct version, which is the pre-tribulation rapture, because here you have the tribulation with the abomination of desolation in the very middle and the glorious return of Jesus Christ at the end and the rapture of the church at the beginning. That's called the pre-tribulation rapture position. Now there are other, you know, there are dear brothers and sisters in Christ whom we love, despite their utter ignorance. No, I'm just kidding. But, but whom we love, who, who have different views on this. There are some that believe in mid-tribulation rapture. Rapture day occurs here, coordinate with the abomination of desolation. There are others who believe in a pre-wrath position, which is the church goes through most of the tribulation, but then is raptured in advance of the bold judgments. Then there's the post-tribulation rapture position that says that the rapture occurs at the same time as the second advent of Jesus Christ. Now these are all wrong positions, and next week I'll, I'll go into why they're wrong and how they're wrong and, and try to show you from uh, the scripture uh, you know, why we believe in, in uh, pre-tribulation rapture. But I, I guess what I would leave you with this week is, is this. The whole point of rapture doctrine is really two things. Number one, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Because this is a certain thing. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, there is a day coming when your body, regardless of how you may feel about your body, regardless of whether it has disease or injury or, or age or, or some infirm problem that you may have, that body is going to be changed to be like the body of Jesus Christ. Awesome. Okay, you, you, that's a great hope that we all have. And by the way, that body is going to be so powerful, it will survive the destruction and recreation of the universe. A very powerful body. Disease will never touch you again. Age will never touch you again. That's in your future. Guaranteed. The second thing to remember, hand in hand with that is, that the rapture can occur any moment. Because it's a pre-tribulation rapture, there are no other signs in advance of that rapture. It could happen any moment. And, and I'll just leave you with this great irony, which, which I'm really looking forward to laughing about when it happens. How many times have you, yourself, or you've heard other people say, boy, I wish the rapture would come. When's the rapture going to come? Oh, I wish it would come now. Oh, I wish it would come now. Oh, I wish it would come now. Been, we've been saying that for 2,000 years. I wish the rapture would come now. You know what's going to happen when the rapture happens? There's going to believe, be believers that say, if I just have a couple more days, you know, before the rapture happens, I'm not quite ready. Well, you better get ready, sports fans, because it's imminent. It could happen before I finish the sentence. It could happen anytime. So you got to be ready now. That's the burden of the church. We have to be ready now. Other dispensations did not have that burden. We do. All right? Our, our great resurrection day is coming, and we don't know when. So live a life of readiness. All right? That's what we're after. All right. We'll see you next week. And we will pick right up with the doctrine of the rapture to finish it up, and then we'll go into the throne room and see what's going on there. Please.